Welcome to this video lecture. In this video lecture we're going to talk about heat transfer correlations for internal convection. If you recall when we talked about external convection there were a bunch of different relationships where they had flow over a flat plate, whether the, that flow was laminar or turbulent made a big difference, um, and we had flow around cylinders, flow through banks of tubes, and for each of those there was a different convection correlation. So the same thing is true for internal convection. There are various combinations and configurations. So to go about calculating the Neusselt number and your H, your heat transfer coefficient, is still a relevant topic here. We're going to cover these fairly quickly though. So in internal convection, when you have fully developed laminar flow with constant flux, your Neusselt number ends up being a constant 4.36. When you have fully developed laminar flow with a constant surface temperature, your Neusselt number is also a constant, and that is 3.66. When you have fully developed turbulent flow, your Neusselt number is a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number, just like you saw in many of the relationships on external convection. So one of those relationships is given here. This particular relationship, you need to use n, this exponent n is equal to 0 0.4 if it's a heating application, and n is equal to 0 0.3 if it's a cooling application. This particular relationship would apply at Prandtl numbers between 0 0.6 and 160, Reynolds numbers over 10,000, and then L over D, so a, a pipe length that is at least 10 times longer than its diameter. And um, again, this would be assuming fully developed turbulent flow where you may be neglecting the entry region. Another relationship also for turbulent flow is given here, where this one depends on the fluid viscosity and the fluid viscosity as evaluated at the surface temperature. So this particular relationship, which has a similar form, it's dependent on Reynolds, numbers, Reynolds number to the 4 fifth and Prandtl number to the 1 third. Um, it has a slightly different leading coefficient out there, but then this viscosity relationship is a little bit more important. So this one is relevant for higher Prandtl numbers. So there are different types of relationships. Um, this is something even beyond these two relationships for turbulent flow. There are a bunch more depending on which experimental study you're using. So my suggestion would be for the purposes of this class to so just get familiar with the fact that there are correlations out there and you need to you need to use your engineering judgment to figure out what the best correlation is. You would want to evaluate fluid properties for most of these correlations at the average mean temperature. I know that sounds a little bit weird, so if you remember the mean temperature, if we had flow through this channel, the mean temperature meant the mean as measured radially, or with respect to z or y, if this is a rectangular shaped channel. So the average mean temperature means that you would take the average of that mean temperature and you would average it out axially as well as radially. So we're already, we've already been dealing with the mean temperature and we're basically, that helps us to reduce these problems down to one dimensional problems. So really we'd be measuring the outlet temperature and the inlet temperature and taking the mean of those two. So that is given here. So uh, for those astute students, you may realize that you may not know the outlet temperature when you're doing this, so this would imply that you'll need to do some iteration in those particular circumstances. So for instance, you may take an educated guess at the outlet temperature at the beginning of the problem, use that outlet temperature to evaluate this average mean temperature, and then calculate your fluid properties, calculate your Reynolds number, Prandtl number, Neusselt number, solve the problem, and then actually calculate what the outlet temperature is based on that guess and then you would need to iterate and update your fluid properties based on that guess. So it can be a little bit tedious but this is part of the procedure with convection. Welcome to this heat transfer video lecture. We're going to talk more about internal convection. Specifically we'll be talking So some other correlations arise from the need to deal with the entry region. So if you remember me talking about when the flow first enters the pipe, those boundary layers start to form, and until those boundary layers grow together and converge at the center of your channel, uh, you would have differing Neusselt number and differing um, convective heat transfer coefficient at the beginning of the pipe. Then once the flow becomes fully developed, like here, 
those those new salt numbers and consequently the um, local heat transfer coefficient tend to level off. So if we do find that it's important to account for this entry length, there are some correlations that give you the average new salt number um, as a function of param several parameters. So one of those parameters is this dimensionless number called the grates number. So this grates number is defined as the pipe diameter over x. Again, this is a number that would change the further down you go into the pipe. In this case, it would get smaller and smaller the further down you go into the pipe, multiplied by the Reynolds number, which in this case for internal flow is a function of the pipe diameter, and the Prandtl number. So this grates number would be input into a new salt number correlation as shown here. So because notice that this is the um, if you have a constant surface temperature so for laminar flow if you have a constant surface temperature so this is when the flow becomes fully developed and you can notice that as your x gets bigger and bigger your grates number will get smaller and smaller and eventually this term will go away and you're left with the um, the fully developed version of the new salt number. So if you do determine that that entry length is a significant portion of your pipe length, then you would need to account for it by using a correlation like this. So the correlations may vary. I'm just showing one example. So this one would apply when you have a thermal entry length, meaning that your flow is not fully developed thermally when it first enters the pipe, but it does um, eventually reach a fully developed form if the pipe is long enough. This would also apply for a combined entry length, and a combined entry length means that both the thermal uh, the thermal boundary layers are still forming and the velocity boundary layers are still forming. So looking at this plot on the right, this shows us some of the different correlations. So here's the one we're looking at if you have a constant surface temperature. If you have a combined entry length, the uh, your new salt number is going to take on this form, or if you have a just a thermal entry length, it'll take on this form. So the combined entry length again implies that the flow is not yet fully developed either in terms of velocity or in terms of temperature. And then you see similar correlations for the constant surface heat flux condition. So a little bit more nuance and a little bit more complexity to deal with, but again this is something that you can neglect if you determine that your pipe is long enough that you can neglect the entry length. We've talked a lot about circular tubes, circular channels, which is what most pipes or tubes are. There may be some non-circular tubes. So in those particular cases we would want to use something called the hydraulic diameter. So the hydraulic diameter can be calculated as four times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. So for a rectangular shape, if this is uh, W and L, our hydraulic diameter would be equal to 4 times W times L, so just this cross-sectional area, divided by the perimeter. So the perimeter is the distance around, so that would be divided by 2W plus 2L. So uh, fairly easy, so you may need to run this type of calculation if you're dealing with a non-circular channel. And you may find non-circular channels in a lot of different places. Certainly there is square ducting, which is used for HVAC purposes. You might have a, a long rectangular duct. So certainly heat transfer is very important in those kinds of applications. So there are quite a few examples where you might be dealing with non-circular tubes. So it's important to know how to deal with those. So when you, so, oh, I forgot to mention, P is actually the wetted perimeter. So we calculated P and I forgot to point out. So this perimeter is anything that is in contact with the fluid would count as the wetted perimeter. Another non-circular shape that you might have would be an annulus. And we have actually dealt with annuluses before in this class. So this area, so the wetted perimeter would be the perimeter of this inner circle plus the perimeter of this outer circle as both are in contact with the fluid. So that's how you'd go about calculating the um, you'd use that wetted perimeter in the calculation of the hydraulic diameter. So for turbulent flow, it's pretty easy. You calculate the hydraulic diameter, you use that hydraulic diameter in the calculation of your Reynolds number, 
and then you just plug in that Reynolds number into the same correlations, the turbulent flow correlations that we've been using for circular tubes. When we have laminar flow, we would use different kinds of relationships. And our book has this table, table 8.1, which gives us new silt numbers for fully developed laminar flow in tubes of differing cross-section. So you can see for a circular, when we have uniform flux, it's 4.36. When we have uniform surface temperature, it's 3.66. We've seen that because it's circular. When you have a square channel, they change. When you have a rectangular channel, you notice there are a lot of different forms of this. So you'd have to look at the aspect ratio, that length divided by the width, to determine which are the appropriate correlations. And you may have to do some interpolating in between if your particular aspect ratio does not line up. So this is a table that you would be able to look up and find the appropriate new silt number relationship. I want to point out that for any of these correlations, when you're getting new silt number, the diameter that you would use when you're back calculating for your H is again going to be this hydraulic diameter.